Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back again talking about spinning reels, salt water, fresh water, a little bit of both. I have no idea. Here's what happened. So the other day, Luke and I are looking up some reels. We got a, a lot of new reels in at the, at the shop, fishstrong.com for our members. And he's like, oh my gosh, I don't see the Fuego on the Daiwa site. And he's kind of freaking out. I'm like, there's no way it's not there. Like we just got a bunch of Fuegos in. Uh, so it's got to be there. And you know, it turns out there's a separate tab just for saltwater spinning reels. And then we went to Shimano and we solved the same thing. And, and that brought up a debate. It was like, man, I wonder how many anglers out there know if they really have a saltwater spinning reel or, or not. And this came up and was a, kind of a, a hot topic on a podcast that we did with Bill DeWeese and, uh, and, and Mark, who's uh, quite the, the real expert. And with bait casters, he was, Mark was saying that, you know, almost all of them are the exact same components, even though it technically says it's meant for salt water. It's the exact same as the fresh one, the same ones the bass guys are using. It might have a little bit different outside or an exterior, but for the most part, it's all the same. Ball bearings the same. Everything else is the same. And so brought up a debate with the whole team is, Hey, like, do, do we know why some of these manufacturers, well, I guess what makes a real salt water versus one that's not, will it last longer? I know at the end of the day, we still got to take care of our stuff, but uh, kind of interesting. So if you look at all of, you know, Shimano spinning reels, which the page goes on forever, there's only four or five that are really like salt water. And, you know, same with Daiwa, they got a ton of spinning reels. And yet there's only, I don't know, seven or eight here that are technically considered salt water spinning reels. So guys, we got a, we got a whole crew here. Jeez. Austin, Justin, Tony, Wyatt, Luke, we got everyone. If you guys are listening in, we got six of us on this panel. Who wants to kick it off? Maybe the new tackle guy, Justin. New tackle guy, Justin Ritchie, yeah. stand up to the podium. Oh, so boy. What's, what's going on here? We got ceiling. We got components. We got bearings. What, like, what's the big picture here? Why? And are, are we using the wrong reels? Like, if I don't have what that's on the saltwater page, should I throw it away, trade it in? What's the deal? You know, I really, I really like the word minutia. I feel like uh, we're already starting with high dollar words, but this is a, I'll get into it. I think that manufacturers, that people get caught up in the minutia for all the different um, types of ways that a manufacturer seals or protects a reel and what separates a reel from freshwater to saltwater. If you go on to any of these major manufacturer sites, Daiwa, Penn, Shimano, they all have their, their branded way of talking about what they do to protect each reel and the different levels of reels. As you go up in price, generally, you get more bells and whistles and you know, Shimano has some vernacular like core protect and X protect. Daiwa has vernacular like, uh, like mag seal. And what is, what is mag seal? You know, what, what is the benefit of having it as a saltwater fisherman or a fisherman in general, if you fish in freshwater and rough conditions and you're waiting a lot, really, what is it? What separates a fresh and a saltwater reel and kind of what we've, you know, what we've chatted about and what we've seen is that uh, really there's two ways of looking at it. Does the reel have a physical barrier to the elements or a chemical barrier to the elements or both? I mean, what, what is the manufacturer doing to prevent water from intruding to the internals and the supercomputer, if you will, of the reel? And so, it, there's a lot of different things. It could be a labyrinth of how uh, the top of the, you know, where if you look at the rotor, okay, and you look at the, uh, the main stem into the center of the reel, there's physical protection from rubber gaskets. Uh, there's where the housing of the anti-reverse sits and what hoods sit over top of the anti-reverse. Can water get over top of it and bleed in? Does the reel have to physically turn upside down and water pour in in reverse to get into the center of the reel where the anti-reverse is and where that pinion meets your, your oscillation cam? I mean, there's a there, that's one side of things, but the other side as we'll get into is what chemical elements have manufacturers included today and over the past 10 plus years, uh, what, what have manufacturers done to their premium reels to help prevent the elements from seeping in? And uh, chemical additions, I mean, Shimano and Dyer are the two I think of right off the bat, is huge. It does make a big difference in terms of prolonging that fresh out of the box, new performance feel on a reel. It, it makes a difference long term. 
Can you give an example of a chemical? Are you talking about like the mag seal oil or are you talking about Shimano's in there spraying some, you know, some chemical on all the reels? Well, uh, and I mean, that's, that's pretty much what it is. If, if we look at a Shimano product, for example, we've talked about NASCI. We've talked about the Shimano Spheros SW, both being at about a hundred to $120 price point range. Um, the, uh, I, I believe they call it X protect. And what they're doing is they're, around the rim of where the anti-reverse sits. So the anti-reverse, if I can take off uh, just a spool of a reel, kind of hard to see the anti-reverse is gonna sit right down in here. And uh, when people hear anti-reverse, they might think of this feature on the reel, on some reels where you can turn the reel in reverse. Um, it's applicable to some freshwater guys that like let's say target smallmouth bass and they they back play fish as opposed to allowing their drag to do the work it's just a technique and a style of fishing a lot of reels nowadays and especially saltwater reels don't have this feature but the anti-reverse is to help prevent slippage uh you're not going to skip gears and you're not going to get back play at all on your reel a lot of saltwater reels don't have this tab it's just a permanent feature on the reel but that component is the last piece before you start getting into the pinion and the main gear inside of the body of the reel. And the more that you can protect that, uh, the more long-term you're going to have that product and it's going to feel buttery smooth. Um, so I'm trying to show just on an example, um, this reel in my hand right now, this is the Daiwa Fuego 3000. I just took the spool off. And uh, if you take Shimano, for example, around the anti-reverse, there is like a hood, okay? And around that hood, Shimano uses a hydrophobic coating that they call, I believe it's X-Protect. And you can see in teardown videos from, from DIY guys all over the place that water will bead up around that entry point and around that lipped um, seal where the entry reverse is to prevent water from seeping in and making contact. So that's their version of a, of a chemical deterrent for water intrusion. For Daiwa, they use MagSeal. And it's just cool to say. I, I love saying that. It's, what it is, is it's, it's like a, it's a ferrous fluid and it's charged. There's a magnet inside of the reel and the fluid itself bonds with that magnet to where any particulate, any granules of sand or minerals or debris that makes contact with that, the couple drops of ferro fluid that they have in this key channel around the anti-reverse and a bearing it will pull it and keep it in place to prevent it from seeping into the body of that anti-reverse. Um, it's really simple in concept, but it, it makes a huge difference. And there's numerous teardown videos that people can look at and see the internals of a Fuego that is, you know, beat to death and fished hard. And you can see that what that mag seal has done. It has contained and kept all of those particulates in a key area to be easily cleaned reapply mag seal and get back out to fishing it's it's huge yeah another reason that we're huge fans of the Daiwa fuego i don't think it's the best reel ever made but it's probably the best value for inshore saltwater anglers i mean you're talking a hundred dollars and you get you know our 20 percent discount as an insider member you're down to 80 bucks whereas i'm looking on shimano's page you know luke and i used to only fish with the the stratic the ci ci4 and i mean that's 230 dollars and that's not even listed as a saltwater spinning reel on Shimano's site, which is really interesting. Um, I would have thought it would be. And same with like the, the new Vanford, which is kind of what it's turned into. Both of those are just, just technically spinning reels on Shimano's site, not saltwater spinning reels. I thought they had some of that, uh, whatever the X-Protect, no? I wonder what it is. That's and not considered. It seems like most of the Shimano saltwater, all the, the, the offshore i don't see any of the typical inshore reels i mean that stella the uh exists oh, yeah, exists under, I mean, yeah under a few hundred dollars at least yeah i think it really comes down to like extreme saltwater use for those true saltwater reels you know if you're fishing in off the beach in the surf where you're dealing with water and sand you're going to want a lot of more of those a lot more seals and protection like the gaskets and the chemical protection and physical protection but even look the, the sphero says and that that's so it's interesting 
Yeah, um, I'm looking at that now. So that because I've used that before the the older model, but even uh, they actually have. I didn't realize they have a thousand and two thousand. But I'm looking. So the weight of the thousand. Oh no! So I'm sorry. That's ten thousand. Yeah. So those are big. Those are big. Okay, I was about to say the weight of it is twenty five ounces, and I was like, "Ooh, that's got to be a really big one." So, <laughs> yeah. Small- uh, well, hello, tennis elbow, throwing that artificial lens <laughs> on that bad boy. <laughs> yeah, so the so the Spheros it has the X shield, and it has gaskets at twelve critical locations throughout the real body, for water resistance, and it also has X Protect, which is the, you know, the chemical that Justin was talking about and yeah. a waterproof body. So seems like it's, I'm oh, sorry. I was gonna say, it just, just seems like it has a lot more things in place to make that a more saltwater friendly reel. Mm-hmm. So another thing we can, we can kind of look at is people talk about bearings in a reel. Okay. Oh, the reel has 10 ball bearings. And generally we assume that the higher the ball bearings, you know, the smoother the reel. Well, we've noticed over time that's not necessarily the case, but which bearings you use does make a big difference. There is a difference between a, a sealed ball bearing and a shielded ball bearing, and that might go unnoticed. You know, a, a shielded ball bearing, um, a metal shielded ball bearing is literally just a ball bearing with a physical metal shield as a casing on the outside to help deter uh, sand and other particulate at larger particulates. But if you have a sealed ball bearing, um, it's going to take a lot, it's going to take much rougher conditions and much longer term exposure to the elements for water and things to seep into a sealed ball bearing. And the biggest problem with that is, is that the price difference between shielded and, and sealed ball bearings, is not that much in raw part, but the maintenance side and the labor side of replacing a sealed ball bearing internally around the anti-reverse or where, you know, the pinion meets up that, that can be, that can be really challenging to completely replace that part and get into that internal. So there's a labor cost to it as well. Um, Ideally it would be something you wouldn't want to change often every, you know, hopefully every couple of years. And that's if you're really fishing hard. Um, But generally speaking in about the hundred dollar price point, for, for most inshore anglers that just want an everyday um, egg beater, for lack of a better expression, everyday spinning reel to go out and get the job done and fish the flats, fish docks, uh, you know, a, a, a shielded ball bearing will get the job done. As long as Tony pointed out something really important, you take care of your reels. You give it a light rinse down. You dry it with a sham wow. I mean, there's things you can do to prolong the life of wow. what would be considered by the manufacturer as a freshwater reel or something that's not in their saltwater category can most certainly be used in saltwater um, as long as you take proper care of it. It's just that it's added security if you do dunk a reel by accident or you take a you know big fish splashes you in your kayak and you just completely douse the reel. You don't have to you know, say, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? My reel is gonna corrode and fall apart, turn to dust. It's not gonna happen. Um, <laughs> Technology has come a long way and general maintenance goes a long way even today. Yeah, and depending on what boat you run in too, we've all been out there before when it's just a rough day and you have some waves that do come over the side. And if your reels are in any kind of uh, position where water could hit them, I mean, I, it happens all the time. Um, so what, what I'm interested, what, do you have any reels that have frozen up or gone bad? Like what's your experience? Cause I know you're a little bit newer to this in, in the big scheme of things. Uh, like what, what did you start with? Which, which reels have you found have been, have been good for salt? Yeah. Water? So, yeah. So when I started fishing, a lot of it was off the beach and I just bought what I would, what I could basically afford as a kid. And that was that Walmart Shakespeare combo. I'm pretty oh, sure yeah. everybody on the team has fished with those. Um, and, and, you know, I didn't know too much about general maintenance, uh, but that would get splashed if I did catch a fish. Um, and I was, you know, going to the water to, to retrieve it. I might get a little bit of spray on it. And, and really those things would probably last me, you know, if I was going to the beach once a week uh, on the weekends, they'd maybe last me three or four trips and then they would start breaking down and I could start feeling the gears grinding all the bearings would get clogged up with stuff, especially sand getting into the reel. That was a huge thing. If there was any kind of sediment that got onto that reel, if I dropped it in the sand once and that, that stuff got in the gears, it was game over. That reel was, was trashed. Um, so 
I really learned a lot about the importance of quality reels uh, from the hardships of surf fishing. Uh, and then that's where I really fell in love with Penn and they do a great job of shielding uh, the chemical and the physical side of things. As Justin talked about, probably more the, the physical side of things. It's very hard to get uh, water into those pen reels. I know a lot of them actually now have uh, protection against even water splashing up from the underside of a reel, which is really where you see a lot of problems occur. Uh, I've, I've had some reels that are salt water, uh, that are technically salt water reels, uh, that if there's a splash from underneath, I can start to notice a difference. But those pen reels, especially when I'm surf fishing, I'm walking out a couple feet onto the sandbar, I'm waiting out a little bit to make a cast, you know, that reel is going to get splashed. It might, you know, take a quick dunk under the water. You know, if it's sitting in a, a sand spike that's not terribly secured and that rod gets dragged, I've had a, this actually, this spin fisher right here, if I can get it in front of the camera. I don't know if I've got a whole lot of room. No, but this is a- fan. Don't let it hit the fan, uh, the hit newest, the fan Yeah, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get it angled here. <laughs> But uh, this is the uh, the Spin Fisher VI, and I had the Spin Fisher V for I mean goodness probably six or seven years. It's still around here somewhere, but I've retired it uh, in, in exchange for this newer, lighter model. And uh, I mean that reel got dragged through the mud. It got dragged through sand. It got dragged into the surf by sharks and other large surf species, and it held up. And it still to this day runs really, really smooth with you know minimal greasing and making sure that the components are lubed up but those reels are sealed really really well now the the downside of having great sealants like that on the pen reels is that they're terribly heavy uh you know even just the the drag systems the instead of uh having felt which is traditionally what we find in, in a lot of drag systems for reels there's carbon fiber drag systems in these uh, these pens i believe it's the ht100 drag system is what it's called um, but you know, that alone is going to add a little bit of weight, but those washers are going to last a lot longer. Uh, the drag is going to stay smooth. Um, and it stays strong. The bearings, all of it's sealed up. And I mean, they just last a long time. Again, there's that trade-off with it being a lot heavier. I would never use that for most of my inshore applications where I'm making a lot of casts for other officials. Uh, but you know, for all of my surf fishing side of things. I'm sticking with most, mostly pen reels. I, I don't believe I actually have any surf fishing setups that aren't pens. And when you say pen, is it, is it just a spin fisher or are there others too that have that? I have some others. I actually have one right here. It, it's not sealed as well. I was just kind of looking for something that I could throw some big jigs with. Uh, this is the pen conflict. Now this is, does have the HT 100 drag system. It's a lot lighter than the spin fisher, um, but it's not sealed as well. I know that the spin fisher VI has an IP six, uh, IPX six rating, which is not something that is, you know, saltwater in saltwater fishing industry specific, you know, they rate a lot of products like, you know, electronics with the IPX rating. And that is a pretty high level rating on that spin Fisher VI. I don't believe that the rating on the conflict is as high. Um, Justin, I know we were talking a little bit earlier about the differences between some of the different pen reels, IPX ratings. I believe you said the slammer has the highest with the IPX six. I think so. Yeah. I think the, the, the spin Fisher VI now has an IPX five and the slammer three has an IPX six and really all that it is, you're right. IPX ratings is used um, in, in a lot of different industries. Um, it's, it's the, it's the amount of water pressure and the time at which uh, an item has exposure to water until water starts to compromise the actual item. So under more pressure, you know, and under a longer period of time, we'll determine what that IPX rating is. Uh, IPX5, I mean, it could be, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I don't know the actual uh, depth and pressure, but let's say you dropped a reel in 35 feet of water for five minutes, an IPX5 rating would be able to cover it. If you had an IPX6, it could be 90 feet of water for 30 minutes. I mean, that's kind of a, a crude way of looking at things, but it is, it's the amount of uh, pressure and exposure to water that it would take for um, something to be compromised or, or be less than what it is intended to be. That's, that's kind of how you gauge an IPX rating. Yeah, I've actually got the, uh, the IPX rating up in front of me. So an IPX5 can survive, this is just the technical definition, device with level five can survive small water jets projected uh, at it and it can last for 15 minutes uh, and when it's submerged in a volume of water uh, of 12.5 liters. 
I guess I, I'm not exactly sure what that, uh, that measurement is right there. That could be wrong, but lasts for 15 minutes and then it goes up IPX six, um, lasts longer and it just continues up to IPX nine, I believe is the longest. That's basically a submarine. Yeah. I think we're on our way to that. I think manufacturers <laughs> are working on that right now. Uh, cool. Austin, what about you? T uh, tell me some, uh, some real stories. What did you start out with? What, what have you had luck with? Um, so I'll be honest. I had no clue that, well, I knew that there was a difference between a, uh, I guess a freshwater reel and a saltwater reel, but not to the extreme of there actually being separate tabs on the websites for saltwater versus a, a regular reel. Um, but I will say that I've always been the type of guy that likes to pick up my reel and actually just fill it and see how heavy it is, see how smooth it is, um, check the anti reverse. And that's how I've kind of determined a, a quality reel versus a, a reel that isn't quality. But I will say that uh, surprisingly, most of the reels that I used growing up were not saltwater reels and they still did okay. So I had a, um, a Sedona, a Shimano Sedona was my first reel that I ever had. And I was a kid and really beating that thing up and it lasted a really long time. And honestly, I can't even tell you what happened to it. That's how long ago it was, but um, it lasted a really long time. And then I've always really liked the Fluger presidents as well. And I think that. Oh, oh well, Presidente is what you meant to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've never had one break. Uh, I think the only thing that's ever happened to my presidents was my own fault for me tying loop knots and putting it around the handle of my reel and then those lines just eventually end up messing up the handle itself but other than that you know I haven't had so many problems with reels that aren't considered salt water now I'm using reels that are considered salt waters I'm using the Daiwa BGs and I'll tell you I do notice a difference they're super smooth super solid reels but I wouldn't say that it's completely necessary to get a saltwater reel. Yeah, I uh, I think that handle is it wasn't. I, I had the president. I used that for a while, and the same the handle was the thing that froze up first. I, and I don't. I think it was just their handle isn't rated, and it gets and it makes sense. It gets a lot of a lot of salt. Like that handle takes a, a probably more more water than anything else. Um, so it makes sense. And, and and I never once greased it up or did anything. So that was the first thing to go in the president. Yeah, I can relate. I, uh, I neglect my reels, I will say that. And so it was, it was impressive how well those reels, considering their, their price points, yeah, did. They're like, yeah, they're like $60, $70, something like that. So they're, um, they're at a price point where you wouldn't expect it to be uh, to last forever, right? Especially right. In you know, Austin, you, you talked about, uh, you know, kind of the, the field test that we all do is, as fishermen, we grab a reel and we turn the handle and we go, wow, man, that's, that's super smooth. And that, that ends up being kind of an indicator for all of us to, to decide whether we want to fish with something and thinking that, you know, a smooth refined reel is obviously a, a well-made reel and we'll do everything I need it to do. And in, in most cases for us as inshore guys, um, that's the case. But when you feel a reel and you, I mean, let's take like a look at the, the pen spin Fisher VI, Wyatt, like that's a perfect example. If you were to turn the handle of a pen spin Fisher VI, um, it's smooth, but it might not feel as smooth as, you know, maybe a, a Daiwa Saltis back bay or, or the ballistic, for example. And that, uh, in their regard, what they're using is there's a lot of seals. There's a lot of physical rubber barriered seals around the handle, um, around the anti-reverse, around the pinion and the main shaft that restrict the movement. But you make up for that loss of fluidity with increased protection. I mean, that, that's kind of the, the give and take. Um, we keep going back to, to Daiwa as, an, as just an example, but you turn the handle of a Daiwa and it feels smooth, but you have a chemical barrier for you know, for, for my elements getting into the body of the reel, that's, that's pretty powerful to have kind of a mesh of both. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the Fluger president, for example, I bet over time that handle, you know, you're talking about taking like lube knots and just kind of holding it as a placeholder of when you want to just have your line ready and pull it off and, and put on a lure. Uh, I think on the Fluger presidents, it's a, it's a hex handle side to where you have to physically screw in the cap as opposed to directly wound into the, the main gear itself. This direct contact is much more fluid and you won't get back play. But at the same time, there's also going to be less uh, 
you know, rubber gaskets and protection and sealing on those type of reels to where over time that hex and that thread's going to wear and you're going to get back play and you're going to get wobble and eventually the elements are going to make its way in and they're going to, they're going to set up shop. So it, it happens. Um, I mean, it, the direct drive handle into the main gear of the reel is not just for fluidity of the reel. It's also for protection as well. Right. Solid. Tony, I know you've used the nasty nasky uh, quite a bit is, is kind of a Shimano's affordable, pretty just like overall tough reel. Is that, would you say that's been one of your kind of all around favorites in terms of uh, under a under hundred bucks, right? Or somewhere around there? Under? Yeah, that's, that's the first, I guess they don't list it as like under their saltwater reels, but they do say for, you know, freshwater use and light inshore use and it does have the things that core protect uh, on this reel and this one here I've had for I think four years now and I still use it to this day just you know a little bit of oil around the reel handle and this does have the design where you have to unscrew the cap and pull the handle out it doesn't screw into the reel so you do have to make sure you take care of that and um, when, uh, on that real quick what do you do what kind of oil do you use how do you actually take care of it I like to use Corrosion X, uh, works really well on pretty much everything and anything. I actually had a reel way back in the day that seized up on me and I just got mad at it. I opened it up, sprayed Corrosion X in there, let it set overnight and it was smooth as butter. <laughs> Granted, it didn't last long after that because all the grease was broken down, but. <laughs> I put it into a bathtub stuff. full of Corrosion X. <laughs> yeah, but um, and it yeah, I'll, I'll just take the reel handle off every few trips or so and just spray a little bit of corrosion X on the shaft of the reel handle then put it back in, screw it in. And that just helps it from getting frozen up inside the reel. That was a big problem I had with these, but other than that, it's, it's a solid reel for the price. But, um, once I started getting into the little higher end reels, I started using the Stratic FL and I've done pretty much zero maintenance on this reel over the past year or so, uh, when it first came out. And it's still super quiet, super smooth, no grinding, uh, nothing like that. But it is double the price. But uh, when you do get into the $100 reels, that's when you you really need to take care of them, do a little bit more maintenance. The Stratic FL, I just missed it down with water after a trip, wipe it down dry, put it away, and still smooth, good as new. What's, what's interesting is the Stratic FL isn't even listed on their saltwater reels page. I was thinking yeah. it would be there. I wonder why it's not. Because I, I thought it was, I thought that was known for being very salt resistant as well. Yeah, that, that's just another thing you have to be a little bit hesitant of too, is how the manufacturer markets their reel, I guess you could say. Because if, of course, they're going to want to have a section for salt water and then a section for fresh water. Uh, if they just throw all their reels on there, people are just going to go to the cheaper reel just by nature. So, you have to be hesitant about that for expensive reels and, you know, lease, you know, expensive reels that aren't very expensive, like the, the Noski and the Daiwa Fuego, you know, they don't get a lot of hype, but they're really good reels at the price point. Yeah, because I was, uh, I'm just, I'm just on the page. I've been, I haven't spent much time with the Shimano. I used to be a diehard Shimano, Shimano everything, and then started using the Daiwa and I've been more, I've been, I feel like I've been leading more toward that, but the Sphero. So on their saltwater page, the Spheros, there's two listings for it. I was in the other one, which the lowest level was 5,000. So they have a separate, a separate listing of the Spheros 3,000 and 4,000. It's uh, it doesn't have all of the protection that the that the bigger one has. I think it was the X Protect is missing, but uh, otherwise it has the waterproof drag, X Ship. I don't know what that is. But it's down, it's down under 10 ounces. So that's the, that's the, looks like the lowest, the smallest saltwater reel that's, that they're claiming is saltwater. Well, no, you got the Stella's, right? The, um, I'm looking here, I mean, a Stella three, like in a 3000, you know, for just a little surf fishing, uh, IPX rating of eight, but it cost $800. Um, and that's according to their Japanese website, uh, the Shima, the Stella FJ IPX rating of eight, nine is the highest. That is a submarine that can stay underwater for days at a time. And uh, man, that's crazy, but you got to pay 800 bucks for it. 
uh, personally, I'd rather have eight Daiwa Fuegos or nine at that, uh, it, you know, and uh, a, a handful of nice rods. Uh, but man, that's crazy. Yeah, the but the smallest one of those is the four thousand, and that's uh, that's twelve. Oh, that had three thousand. It's four. Oh, yeah, I don't see a three on there. I see a thirty thousand. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's some giant ones. Yeah, the the Spheros is there. Uh, it looks like the lowest price one, and I think those are in like the one eighty ish range. If I remember, well, I'm right. just I'm on I'm just on Google, and so they have Stella uh, FJs from a thousand all the way up to ten thousand on here. So. Just to kind of if throw you're spending seven hundred dollars on a Stella one thousand, I want to know what you're using it for. That's crazy. I want to know what rod you have it on. <laughs> that's, yes, that's all I want to know. <laughs> if, you're, if you're willing to drop that much on a reel, I mean, and, and you need that rod to be able to execute all the the wow power. I mean, that's the new that's the new measure of <laughs> you. We're going to measure things on wow power. Uh, the wow power of a Stella. You know, what are you going to have on there to be chucking a, a you know a big plug or, or soaking a big live bait? You got to have something that, you know just as you know just as powerful. Pulling up with my eight seven hundred dollar one thousand series reel. That's crazy. Um, do, so, do you, do you guys know? I, uh, I I mentioned it earlier when we had the podcast talking about the bait casters. Do, do you guys know the whole story or facts behind that? Do you know Justin in terms of the you know market mentioned that they're pretty much one hundred percent the same? Is that true? Is there anything? that any of these companies are using on just the outside to see them a little bit better? I mean, is there, is there anything they're using that, that on both bait casters and, and uh, spinning? No, I think that the way water makes contact with a bait caster is entirely different than, than a spinning setup. You know, you pretty much have water coming directly onto your spool uh, with a bait caster. And sometimes those spools have notches and holes inside of them that will eventually lead to your main gear on the left side of, of the reel. Um, I would think that just initially, that's probably going to be a lot of rubber seals. I don't know what chemical barriers they have. And um, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, when we were talking about the quantum smoke, for example, is just one. Uh, I'd, I'd have to look and see kind of how that works differently on a bait caster. And there's there's one that I'd be interested in looking into that's pretty new in the industry. And that's uh, Penn came out with a series of their Squall uh, or Fathom bait casters. I mean, Penn got into the bait cast market pretty big here just just the other month ago. And uh, you know, Penn's reputation as being a, a making very well sealed durable products to tap into the bait casting world and making some powerhouse bait casters is going to be something really interesting to look into um because you know again they have ipx ratings they have particular ways that they <clears throat> that they divert water if you will from making their way into the internals and the way the locations that they place all of their seals uh it'll be interesting to to check and see yeah i know, I know market even mentioned just just even the the paint they use in terms of how they're the protective coating they're just uh, putting on there. Uh, obviously with a 100% bash reel, they're not really worried about it. And they were just even spending a little time on that, but I thought that was fascinating. Um, and I think Tony, you brought it up or, or one of you guys did the, the big question is who's really moderating this stuff, right? I mean, clearly it's comes down to marketing and clearly every manufacturer can put whatever reel they want in any category they want to. Uh, so that, that part is, is kind of interesting that some of these things are not underneath the salt water and they could be two or $300 for it, which is an expensive reel and uh, vice versa. You got some that are under a hundred and considered saltwater spinning reels. So this is good. This is good. Kind of good conversation. I wish everyone had this IPX rating. I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, clearly we've heard about it. We've talked about it, but it's, it seems to be that there's there's not like a place you can go look to see the ipx rating of any reel out there has anyone done that is there any do you guys know justin anybody no i'm sure manufacturers are the ones that actually get it tested so if it's not something that's high enough admirable they probably don't right. make it public because i'm googling just for even shimano and the, the one came up because they're proud of it the ipx rating of eight but i don't see it for any other reels which is interesting so you're probably right. They they probably know it. They know how to take a reservation. They know how to keep a reservation. Seinfeld, anyone? Anyone with me? Uh, I'm with you, Joe. I'm with you. <laughs> I think something else important to consider when you're thinking about how sealed you want a reel, because there's trade-offs. Like I said, with the the pens, they're 
you know, the more ceiling that you have, it is not only going to get more expensive, but it's also going to get uh, a little bit heavier, unless you're talking about some of the really high dollar reels, Joe, like the, the Stellas uh, that, that are just made with such high quality um, parts that, you know, they can be super light, uh, but also provide a really high level of protection. But uh, back to what I was saying, I think it's really important to consider uh, the trade-off because, for example, uh, in a kayak, I believe you should have a little bit more ceiling uh, than somebody that is in a boat. Um, for example, you know, fishing with Luke down in Florida and seeing, you know, all the different situations on a skiff, uh, very rarely would I see my reels getting anything more than a little bit of spray from the sides. Um, and and I'm, I'll be completely honest here, after about a year of using one of my Fuegos in my paddle kayak before I was able to get the pedals and I'm splashing water all over it, after about a year, I could feel it kind of sticking up. And this is a reel I took care of uh, and did really well with, but you know, it, it getting so much water on it from splashing around and everything, um, you know, it just, it took its toll. Uh, but now I've been using the ballistic, which is a little bit more sealed. It's a step up from the Fuego. Uh, I believe there's one or two more ball bearings, but it's more sealed uh, than, than the Fuego. And it's got a little bit different of a body. Uh, I'm not sure if the chemical protections are any different, um, but I, I'm been very surprised with how much more, uh, resistant it's been than my Fuegos. And I, I've got a, a review that's a long time coming. It's coming soon, but uh, I would say for sure it is worth it if you are in a situation like you're surf fishing or you're in a kayak to opt for a little bit more expensive reel so that you can get that protection because, you know, having to replace reels every couple months or uh, however often you have to because you're subjecting it to that kind of abuse, it's worth it to just spend a couple extra bucks and get a reel that's a little bit more saltwater rated. Uh, I know with some of the other reels that I, I, I'm actually thinking of the, the, the Noski versus the Fuego, one of the first trips I took out in that kayak, I got flipped by a boat wake. Um, the Fuego survived the dunk, the, the Noski did not. Uh, again, that mag seal did a good job of protecting it, at least from that. I think that might've been the reel that eventually, uh, eventually lost it. But um, really just, I think it's much more worthwhile to, to think about what type of activity you're doing, how much saltwater abuse that reel is going to receive, uh, and then you can really make an informed decision on, on what reel you need to have so that you're not wasting money replacing it month after month. Yeah, yeah those ballistics, those are sick, man. Because I'm a big, Luke and I are both big fans of the Fuego. It's just the value. I, I don't stress about letting, you know, my nine-year-old daughter use it, you know, and like when she's standing knee-deep in water. Uh, ballistic, even though I know it's mag sealed and it's got all the protection, I get anytime you get a $200 plus reel, you, you, you're a little bit more careful with it. You know, it, it's why you don't see a lot of charter guides using ballistics or, or even, you know, Stratix and some of these really expensive reels. Cause they, I mean, that people just, they don't know how to use them correctly. They dunk them, they drop them in the water, drop them on the ground, leave them on the ground when they're, you know, bringing the fish in. So, um, uh, I got a question. So, I can give you a gift. I'll, I'll love to hear all your answers. Either I'll buy you a ballistic or a Vanford, both kind of competitors, similar prices. You take the ballistic or the, or the Shimano Vanford? Well, the ballistic, ballistic for me, no doubt. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been blown away by the Fuego and the ballistic's a big step up from that. So I don't, I don't have a, a ballistic, but. No, oh, then yeah, this is good timing for my gift. <laughs> Thank you. You're the best, you're the best brother so, I've ever had. Your birthday's I, coming up, right? That's true. That's true. I've had well, several renditions in the past of CI4 pluses for the Stratic CI4. And the Vanford is the replacement of the CI4. Like the, the Stratic CI4 is no longer, it is now called a Vanford. It's essentially the same category with a different brand name so that the Stratic can continue to be a Stratic without making all these little you know, off versions of a Stratic and all the little differences. The Vanford is a Vanford, but all intents and purposes, it's a CI4. I've, and I've had my challenges and frustrations in the past with uh, roller bearings blowing out on CI4s. I, I have had in the past CI4s that I thought were lightly used of seven or eight months and it would started to seize up on me. I remember I had one particular trip where I went snook fishing down in Fort Myers and uh, it was like April or May, a big school of snook was on the sand flat near some docks. I skipped a jerk bait up to him, hooked into one snook, set the hook, tried to turn the handle. I was not gaining any line. My reel was froze. And I'm hooked up into a 34 inch fish asking myself, I don't understand why this reel is froze up. It's a Stratic CI4. Like this is a creme de la creme. And 
and I, and I learned that over time it had gotten, you know, corrosion and, and, and the elements had made its way into the reel and it was just not performing as smoothly as it was when it was brand new. Um, I have a 6,000 ballistic as well. I use offshore when I'm kayak fishing and I'm jigging for 30 pound amberjack and 20 pound blackfin tuna and, and some crazy pelagics. And, you know, I, I still would stick with the ballistic because of that, you know, that mag seal. I mean, that's really what's going to deter, uh, you know, stuff from setting into the reel. Um, and I guess one last quick thing to think about is uh, price point doesn't, as we've learned, price point does not always mean more protection for saltwater, you know, corrosion and, and the elements getting in. Uh, the ballistic and the fuego are about $100 in difference. They both have mag seal. But there are differences in the body. There's differences in the material used in the body. Uh, there's differences in... Um, Gosh, I just had the, the spark notes looking at things from from 10,000 feet up, you know, Zion material, there's probably, a, a, you know, different gaskets and, and rubber rubber gaskets to protect water from getting inside. And, uh, you know, that's really what starts separating, you know, price and class of different reels. But in terms of mag seal, mag seal is the same. Mag seal doesn't change based on a hundred dollar gap in a reel. Uh, it still gets the job done. And it's, it's got a cooler name, but Balli I mean, ballistic, Come ballistic, on. On ballistic yeah. on that fish. <laughs> that pretty cool too. What about you, Tony? So I got Wyatt, Luke, Justin, you all say ballistic over CI4. What do you think, Tony? I know you're a Shimano guy. Yeah, I'd probably have to go with the ballistic. I haven't personally tried it, but I've had I've had the same issues Justin had with the CI4, and since the Vanford's pretty much the same thing, I don't see myself getting a Vanford. Um, if you had to compare it to the FL and the ballistic, it'd probably have to be the FL. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd go with the ballistic. Cool and ballistic, much better name than Vanford. I mean, what is that? Are they named after? Some old man or a street or something. I feel like I heck? have to like tuck my shirt in and go fish. I'm on oh, a fish oh, with a man. Sure. It's uh, the latest really, series here at Ralph Lauren. <laughs> what I really about you, Austin? Heard much about the? Haven't heard much about the Vanford, whether good or bad. Either they just don't have many out there yet, or I don't sure. know if they're even. I haven't seen them out for sale anywhere yet. I've, I've seen a couple, but uh, it, it's it's rare. I, I don't think they've had their big shipment come through just from all the same reason we're having trouble at fishstrong.com getting a lot of, I mean, we got we get a, like a bulk order that shows up randomly. I just don't think anyone's got that big bulk order yet. So, Yes, I do want to get one to test it out you know, just to see the difference. Yep. But, what about you, Austin? Ballistic? Ballistic. Ballistic all day after hearing what Justin said. Uh, I didn't know that the CI4 was basically the Vanford now, so thank you for that. But with that being said, ballistic all day because I've had a CI4, and needless to say, it's been down more than I've got to use it. So we're going ballistic. Yeah, when we did a podcast on that, um, it's called the new reel, new spring reel for 2021, and that was kind of the big news. Is and, and I don't think Shimano has done a good job of, of announcing that too, but basically the CI4 is, will be going away this year and, uh, and it will just turn into the Vanford, but you got to tuck your shirt in and make sure you got a collared shirt when you're fishing. So you need fa fancy cufflinks, a tie, <laughs> you know, cummerbund isn't required, but it's probably going to help you catch more cumberbund. fish. Cumberbund. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty funny. Um, well, cool guys. This is helpful. I'm seeing the time. I know we have another uh, call. We got a couple that's got to jump on here. Uh, but we'll continue to do more of this. I, we'd love feedback, by the way, because we don't have all the answers. Clearly, this is just something that happened. We're like, let's just get on a podcast and talk through it. I've learned some things today. I've learned that Justin has a pretty good vocabulary as well. I got like eight words that I now have to go look up that you used earlier. So I uh, appreciate that. You gave me uh, something to do. But let us know. Go to saltstrong.com and look for the blog post on this under the fishing tips section and below at the very bottom we always have a place for comments and you'll see pretty much every one of our posts gets comments and we love getting them we uh we love hearing the questions you have and normally that's how we get ideas for future podcasts and for future fishing tips and then of course if you haven't joined the insider club what the heck are you waiting on this is your chance today to take charge of your life to take charge of your fishing game and stop spending so much money on tackle, stop paying full price for it and not getting all the use out of it. Our whole job in the Insider Club is to help you save money on the tackle and then show you how to go find the feeding zones all year long, every single weekend, no matter if you live in Texas, if you matter if you live in Florida or in Virginia or anywhere in between, we want to help you get to the finish line faster to show up at the ramp or at the dock or the marina, wherever you are with fish picks, with stories, 
and big smiles and not going there ashamed and like, Hey, I hope no one talks to me because I didn't catch anything. It's not fun. We've all been there. And that's why we created the insider club. So we'd love to have you in there. You can go join us completely risk-free by the way, for a whole year. That's unheard of risk-free whole year. If it doesn't work for you, if you didn't save time or money, you get all your money back. So join us there at saltstrong.com as well. It's the insider club. Otherwise let us know what you think about the podcast by going to saltstrong.com, looking for the show notes. And we will talk to you guys in the next episode. We out. Peace. Thank you guys. Later. Good job.